technical uh, information is is uh, not for the, the faint of heart. So I'll try and uh, be general about uh, a lot of this information, keeping in mind that our website uh, has everything here uh, that uh, that I'll be discussing this afternoon. First of all, I want to cover a little bit of background information about NERPC. Uh, we are a uh, regional planning commission established under Indiana law. Uh, we were created in 1965 and most recently, uh, our, our most recent legislative changes back in 2005 uh, recrafted us as a council on government which means that we have representation from every uh, city, town, uh, county unit on our board of directors. We have since the 1970s also served as a metropolitan planning organization uh, under uh, federal um, USDOT law and regulations. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking most about today. Uh, we serve uh, Lake Porter and LaPorte counties um, one interesting fact, and this was a uh, result of our 2005 legislative update, uh, we have become a, a council of government. All of our board members, all 53, are elected officials. On the uh, metropolitan planning organization side, uh, we that were designated by Governor Bowen back in, uh, I believe, 1975. Uh, as the uh, uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Chicago, the Indiana portion of the Chicago Urban Heights area. And this is the, uh, uh, which run, uh, I'll show you a map in, in a second or two here. Uh, and then uh, in about 2003, we were named uh, the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Michigan City Laporte urbanized area, which is uh, primarily in Laporte County. But we are charged under the, the federal law and uh, transportation planning regulations to conduct a continuing cooperative and comprehensive, otherwise known as 3C planning process. We look at surface transportation, which is usually restricted to uh, highways and public transit. We don't deal with airports. We don't deal a lot with railroad issues or uh, transportation by, uh, by ship. Uh, we have economic growth and development responsibilities, fuel consumption, uh, and air pollution responsibilities. Um, but the, uh, in the end, uh, the main charge uh, to us as a uh, MPO is to uh, preserve the existing transportation system. We have we produce three basic documents, uh, one uh, every year, another one every two years, another one every four years. The long-range uh, transportation plan is prepared every four years. Uh, our most recent update was in 2011. And we will be up, uh, put, putting through an, another update in May of next year. But that is a uh, comprehensive look at our region's transportation needs over the next 20 years. Uh, it gives us guidance, overall guidance, in terms of, of what types of projects uh, to uh, put in our plan. Uh, it identifies all the capacity increasing projects uh, and uh, uh, will uh, uh, provide basic guidance to the spending of federal funds that are allocated to our region. The Transportation Improvement Program, as I mentioned, is updated every other year. Uh, this is a four-year list of surface transportation projects. Uh, regionally significant projects, regardless of where the money comes from, are um, included in the TIP. Uh, anything else that involves federal, federal transportation funds, uh, meaning from either uh, from Federal Transit Administration or Federal 
Federal Highway Administration are included as well. Uh, our Unified Planning Work Program is updated every year. This, identi this document identifies uh, the current planning activities that we're undertaking uh, with regard to uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Our current TIP, which is the four-year spending plan, right now has uh, just about a thousand line item entries. You can see the breakdown here of those uh, uh, types by sponsor. We have more public transit projects in our TIP than anyone else in Indiana, simply because we have so many transportation or public transit operators. Uh, uh, simply having a line item does not mean that's an individual project. That is simply a line in our TIP. And in most cases for construction projects, we have three line items per project, uh, one for engineering, one for right-of-way, and one for construction. Over the four-year period, uh, the various parties that are uh, undertaking transportation projects will be spending approximately 1.2 billion uh, in total dollars and 770 million in federal funds. This is a record investment for the region. Uh, the highest we were ever at before was just a little over a billion dollars. So uh, we are seeing, especially at the MDOT level, uh, a record investment in transportation projects. We have two urbanized areas. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Chicago and Michigan City urbanized areas. Here's a graphic that shows the, uh, uh, it's a little hard on the eye, but you can essentially see that roughly the top two-thirds of Lake County uh, is urbanized and about the top half uh, of uh, Porter County is urbanized. And then we have uh, Michigan City and Laporte as a standalone urbanized area. A map that shows this a little clearer and shows the various communities in the region uh, is, uh, is uh, on this uh, slide. Uh, the federal aid projects uh, uh, that are done are large measure done because we're in we're an MPO and we have this urbanized area status. Every year uh, we're apportioned dollars from the U.S. Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, the, this funding comes under four basic project program categories: the Surface Transportation Program or STP. Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, or CMAC, Highway Safety Improvement Program, or HSIP, and Transportation Alternatives Program, or TAP. From FTA, we have basic uh, public transit formula grants under 5307, uh, bus capital grants under 5339, Section 5339, and State of Good Repair grants for commuter rail, uh, all uh, established by by Congress in uh, transportation authorization statutes. What can you do with these funds? Uh, STP funds are general purpose funds for highways, bridges, uh, bike and ped facilities, transit capital. There's a, a number of different uses for this, but where, where we use it primarily here in Northwest Indiana is for roadway reconstruction and bridge projects. Congestion mitigation and air quality program are, it is uh, kind of an experimental program set up by Congress to, uh, for regions to come up with different ways to address uh, the reduction of ozone producing emissions. And they, uh, we'll go, get into a few more details later on that, but it, uh, it's one, a rare program because it can't be used to add single, in, uh, single occupant vehicle capacity, neither can it be used for preservation and maintenance projects. But there's a whole lot of different things that it can be used for. Highway Safety Improvement Program uh, provides construction funds for improved highway safety projects. And the Transportation Alternatives Program 
uh, provides uh, construction funds for bicycle, pedestrian, and environmental mitigation projects. In the transit categories, 5307 provides basic capital for operating support, capital and operating support. Uh, the two other, uh, ca our capital program, uh, bus capital 5339 and uh, state of good repair funds for commuter rail. Here's the money that we uh, receive every year. Uh, as you can see, within the Chicago urbanized area, it's uh, just under $18 million a year. Within the Michigan City LaPorte urbanized area, it's just at uh, actually a little bit less than $2 million a year. Um, it's uh, the, the, and largely the apportionment is based on population. So uh, the uh, Chicago urbanized area portion has uh, uh, a rough a population of over 700,000, and the uh, population of the Michigan City Laporte Urbanized Area is roughly 60, 65,000. Where does this money come from? Uh, this was uh, something I always wondered, uh, and uh, it's actually fairly simple: motor fuel excise taxes. Uh, these are dollars that you and I pay when we, we fuel our vehicle uh, at a uh, filling station. You can see the tax rates here, 18.3 cents per gallon for gasoline, 24.3 cents for diesel. Uh, propane, which is one of our newer fuels being used for motor vehicles, uh, the rate there is 13.6 uh, cents per gallon. Uh, how does this money get to us? Uh, first off, the, uh, the wholesale vendors uh, of the fuel actually pay these uh, tax funds to uh, the Treasury. The Treasury puts uh, money into the Highway Trust Fund, and then Congress appropriates those dollars to Federal Highway and FTA. And then there's a distribution to the states. The states suballocate the funds to the urbanized areas. And the MPOs, such as NERPC, allocate the funds to individual projects. NERPC uh, has its own uh, stakeholder-driven processes that uh, assign those dollars out to projects. Uh, we have four primary stakeholder groups. The Environmental Management Policy Committee, or EMPC, the Ped Pedal and Paddle Committee, 3P, Surface Transportation uh, uh, Committee, CSC, and the Transit Operators Roundtable for Transit Projects, and then a standalone group of just the LaPorte County uh, stakeholders. Uh, each group is responsible for uh, developing a process for selecting federal aid projects within their area of expertise and or jurisdiction. Uh, the, uh, the, those committees, those groups, normally uh, in the past have uh, made those uh, uh, selections or recommendations for uh, selections, brought them into our Transportation Policy Committee for ratification, and then uh, clearing that uh, hurdle, they're, they're then sent on to the uh, NERPC board for confirmation. So it's a, uh, we're looking at altering this process in the future uh, to uh, actually centralize the uh, prioritization of the funding uh, and, and, and definitely still using these groups but actually uh, utilizing our comprehensive plan uh, steering committee as a way to uh, prioritize certain types of projects over others. And we're looking to uh, make those changes within the next three to four years. The stakeholder jurisdictional areas are identified here uh, for uh, Environmental Management Policy Committee. These are the uh, where they have jurisdiction is over what I'll call the non-traditional CMAC projects, and that could, could include uh, 
mainly non-construction activities, uh, the purchase of alternative fuels, alternative fuel infrastructure, uh, um, alternative fuel vehicles, uh, repowering of uh, diesel engines, be they uh, on-road diesels or uh, locomotives. Uh, we've done several of those. Uh, and uh, other what I'll call unusual projects, uh, only unusual though in the, the sense that they don't involve construction, um, like planning or carpooling, um, those types of activities. The Pen, Pedal, and Paddle Committee usually uh, functions, usually uh, its primary interest is in, not, in improving non-motorized public transit or or transportation generally, and with uh, the construction of bicycle and pedestrian facilities, including sidewalks. They have uh, access to three different types of funds, uh, which, whereas compared to EMPC, only has access to CMAC funds. Surface Transportation uh, Committee um, actually has oversight over uh, SDP, CMAC, and HSIP funds. And those are our, our bread and butter construction type projects uh, that you'll find there. Uh, transit operators uh, prioritize uh, uh, their own transit projects primarily within Lake and Porter counties uh, and uh, uh, serve as a, a great group of people for uh, uh, recommending how those dollars get spent. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, LaPorte County stakeholders are kind of in a standalone category because it is a, a standalone urbanized area. And a lot of the rules that pertain to Lake and Porter don't pertain to LaPorte. So we like to meet specifically with that, those group, that group of stakeholders to ensure that uh, their uh, issues are handled adequately. NERPC board approval of projects, there's two common methods through which this occurs. Uh, usually uh, after a committee has uh, decided or recommended a project, we, uh, we've done it two different ways and we're, we're kind of evolving uh, toward the second method that I've listed here, uh, but right now we're still uh, including new projects in the TIP as the, man, the first uh, time that the board will actually weigh in on the approval of a project. Uh, we'll be doing a new TIP next year and the new projects uh, that we, we're in the process of selecting right now will be included in it. Uh, the board approved through their approval of the TIP or TIP amendment that can happen to uh, is their uh, approval of the project. In other cases, uh, uh, we have lists of projects being submitted uh, directly to the board from standing committees. Uh, the board some occasionally reviews and approves the list of projects, uh, and then it has to be uh, included in the Transportation Improvement Program. Excuse me. Once a project has been selected and is in the TIP, uh, what do we do next, or what happens next? For the federal highway project funded projects, NERPC will request a DES number from NDOT, and that gets the project within the production uh, NDOT's uh, production system and our own production system as well. Uh, the uh, the community, if it's a construction project, has to have something called an employee and responsible charge. And that is a, an employee of the community that uh, the community has entrusted with all management decisions regarding the federal aid project. NDOT wants one person, uh, a one person to contact. It doesn't want to have to guess and, uh, as to who they should contact regarding 
uh, issues concerning a federal aid project. And so this requirement uh, actually uh, helps simplify and streamline that process. For federal, uh, federal highway funded projects, uh, a master agreement has been kicked out. Uh, it, that document needs to be executed and returned as directed and within a reasonable amount of time. We've had some communities sitting on those things for six months. And uh, we've, we've talked to them, uh, uh, NDOT has spoken with them. At, after a year, those, those uh, agreements uh, lapse. And they have to issue a new one uh, at that point in time. So it's really important to communicate with NDOT if there's going to be a delay in executing that master agreement. In some cases, uh, for uh, alternative fuel projects, CMAC funded uh, fuel infrastructure and the like, uh, we are, NERPSI is involved in uh, the agreement for those types of projects, and you'll receive special instructions on what to do with those uh, uh, agreements uh, when uh, uh, when they're offered to your your uh, community. The selection of an engineering firm is probably your starting point. It's uh, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in terms of getting going on your project if you're doing construction. What uh, you need to know is, is uh, number one, you're going to have that employee in responsible charge already has gone through training. That person should know what to do next. And there are, there are some communications that only occur between the community and NDOT, and we are, NERPC is not a party to that. But what we do uh, offer communities a little, is a little bit of help in getting going uh, to get your engineer on board. Uh, if your project does require design process, uh, design services, then you need to begin a co consultant selection and procurement process. NDOT has made it uh, easier than falling off a log backward uh, by putting a uh, RFP toolkit on their website uh, and uh, walking you through uh, the process hand in hand pretty much. Uh, what you need to know uh, is that uh, you have to follow NDOT's system if you want to be able to reimburse your consultant. If you want to hire your own a firm of your own choosing, uh, you may do so, but you may not request reimbursement for federal funds uh, if that is the case. Also, if you have a, uh, a city and an engineer that's a qualified consultant, uh, those costs are not reimbursable as well. Um, but you should be prepared to cover those costs at 100% local if you want, if you do not use uh, NDOT's procurement method. All design consultants, regardless of how they were procured, have to be NDOT pre-qualified. And that procedure, again, is explained in great detail on NDOT's website. But it's up to the individual community to negotiate the contract terms with whatever firm they've recommended for selection. Uh, once NDOT has reviewed your decision, and you've submitted all the necessary documentation uh, and negotiated a price for the contract. Uh, you submit all that to NDOT, and they'll kick out a written contract to you. you a good rule here to follow is that you don't uh, get, you don't start the consultant working on your project until you have the fully executed contract in place, meaning that your community has executed it and sent it back to NDOT, and they've sent it back to you fully executed, and 
issued you a notice to proceed. If you incur costs uh, uh, without that notice to proceed, you will not be reimbursed for those costs. Uh, it's uh, uh, actually a fairly simple rule of thumb. Um, and uh, the only thing, the only uh, phase here that is not a cost reimbursement uh, project or process has to do with the construction contract itself. Everything else through NDOT and Federal Highway is reimbursed, which means you have to uh, take delivery of whatever the item is, or uh, if a consultant has billed you, uh, you've purchased alternative fuel, you've installed uh, an alternative fuel infrastructure, whatever it is, you, you have to pay 100% of that cost and then you turn in your claim for reimbursement of the federal share. Um, in the case of construction contracts, uh, those are handled differently and you will actually pay the 20% uh, local share to NDOT uh, prior to execution of the construction contract. Uh, NDOT has uh, really clamped down on this. There were a lot of abuses of this uh, process. Now they are requiring uh, canceled checks and actual proof that, of payment uh, so that uh, uh, you can document yourself um, that the, uh, the reimbursement is in fact a reimbursement and it's not a, an advance on payment. Um, your your uh, consulting engineer, and I don't have a slide for this, is probably uh, your shepherd through this entire maze of bureaucratic rules, regulations, and requirements. Uh, that's part of most of the reason why they want them pre-qualified. NDOT wants engineers working on projects that are familiar with NDOT's system and way of doing business. Uh, and their design standards. Uh, and the pre-qualification process is, is their way of ensuring that most of them do. Um, NDOT also uh, has a, a database of, uh, of uh, consultants that you, you may access uh, as needed uh, if you have any questions about uh, past performance of your uh, consultants on any uh, previous projects. Um, NERPSI's in, involvement in this uh, uh, whole process uh, has grown in recent years. We would, in the past, simply select projects and we were done with, uh, you know, there was no need to get engaged with uh, uh, the communities or with NDOT on these projects. After all, the uh, construction contracts are, are uh, structured to run between uh, a unit of government and NDOT, and NERPSI really isn't a, is not a party to those agreements. However, um, NDOT and Federal Highway have uh, uh, enhanced uh, our oversight of uh, uh, these projects. Uh, immensely in the past few years and actually uh, um, passed on the uh, accounting uh, duties that uh, most of which were formerly uh, assumed by NDOT in Indianapolis for keeping uh, track of these projects, be it through change orders or contract amendments and the like. There are two uh, primary aspects of our oversight. Uh, the quarterly tracking meetings that we conduct. I think we've been doing those, those for like two years now. Um, it's a face-to-face -face meeting with between uh, the project sponsor and NDOT and NERPSI. Uh, we go through all the uh, communities' uh, federal aid projects one by one and talk about problems and opportunities and changes that need to be made. Uh, 
usually uh, we've, we uh, structure these over four to five uh, review days uh, over a few weeks. I think our next uh, round of meetings is coming up uh, in uh, early November. Uh, these meetings have been uh, very valuable in uh, uh, keeping us in, uh, informed as to where, where these projects are in terms of implementation. The second tool that NDOT has provided us with is an online quarterly reporting process or LQR system, uh, which uh, everyone is required with the federal aid project is required to participate in. Uh, these uh, reports, uh, which uh, are trans are transmitted to us uh, by the, by the project sponsors, we clear them and send them on to back to the community, and then the community is able to send them on to NDOT. So uh, uh, these uh, condition these uh, rep the reporting as well as the tracking meetings are required for every federal aid project that we fund. And we uh, mainly, if, if we found it next to impossible to uh, keep on top of a project, uh, when uh, we don't have any reports filed for it or uh, the community has chosen not to cooperate with us in scheduling a, a project tracking meeting. And for that reason, uh, we uh, will unfortunately need to to uh, do unpleasant things uh, to a project if uh, uh, if those two conditions aren't met. Uh, what is this? Uh, uh, right uh, right now, we're looking at just under a hundred of these reports every quarter. We're spending about eight and a half minutes on each one of them. And all told, it takes about a week, a little over a week, to get through these things. Uh, but that's it in terms of the, uh, the basics for federal funding here. Um, we've got, uh, 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 in essence, uh, a, a changing system that we're looking at here, both in terms of how we are selecting projects uh, the o level of oversight that we're exercising over these projects. And we're also seeing uh, a lot of opportunities out there at NDOT and Federal Highway for to get informed and to get educated in terms of how to manage these projects. This information simply wasn't there six or seven years ago. So NERPSI, uh, federal agencies, and NDOT all want every, every project to succeed. Uh, there is uh, uh, so much that our communities are doing in terms of projects, things from a $60 million uh, grade separation in Munster to a $750 uh, bicycle rack project. I mean, we've seen a little bit of everything come through here. And it's good that this to see this money going uh, to a good purpose. Um, the final topic today is uh, uh, has to do with a uh, call for projects, a solicitation for projects that uh, we have issued just this morning. Uh, I hope, and I have my fingers crossed, that uh, uh, the NOFA has been published on our website uh, this morning. I haven't checked to confirm that yet, but uh, I was told that it would be there. Um, this is a uh, consolidated call for projects. Uh, I want to point out I've got an error on the uh, header for this one. We, it should be 2014-2. Uh, we are soliciting uh, HSIP and CMAC projects in Lake and Porter counties, and HSIP, CMAC, and SDP projects in LaPorte County. Um, uh, roughly 23.3 million in Lake and Porter, and 8.8 .8 million in LaPorte. Uh, so 
submission deadline is uh, December 1st, 2014. Eligible applicants are, uh, are kind of par for the course. Um, usually DOT money is open only to units of government. The CMAC program has, is a little bit different uh, in that it uh, uh, opens the door for funding to other uh, uh, non-governmental organizations in some cases. But in those, those instances, it is uh, with written agreements uh, with a qualifying unit of government. So cities, towns, counties are all eligible. Uh, park boards, uh, redevelopment commissions, and the like are not. We need uh, what we need for uh, we need uh, applications to come from uh, the chief elected officials, meaning county commissioners, town councils, uh, or the mayor. Uh, in the case of cities, uh, Gary Public Transportation Corporation. NICD or Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District are each uh, eligible to apply. Uh, state agencies, uh, including uh, the state universities, IU, Purdue, Ivy Tech in our area. Uh, the other entities that I mentioned uh, could include uh, 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 not-for-profit businesses, for-profit businesses, uh, the like uh, I mentioned earlier that we had funded a couple of locomotive retrofits, engine repowers, and uh, those were for uh, uh, for U.S. Steel. So if there's any type of uh, alternative uh, fuel project out there uh, that anyone is interested in, uh, please let us know. We'd like to. Uh, explore the possibilities on that. What to submit? We have application forms on our website. Probably the most significant thing to put on there, besides the dollar amount that you need, is the purpose and need statement. A purpose uh, of your project is just what it is. If the purpose is to construct a, a sidewalk from point A to point B, that is the purpose. The need for that needs to be quantified, though, uh, and that's really where we're after the details. Why is this needed now? Uh, why is it needed at all? Uh, those simple questions need to be laid out on paper, and that's probably the most uh, uh, time-consuming or difficult part associated uh, with the application form itself. There's some other pro program, what I'll call programmatic documentation. Uh, it's more uh, uh, mathematically oriented uh, with regard to the Highway Safety Improvement Program funds because those uh, projects require uh, a cost-benefit analysis uh, for uh, some types of HSIP projects. It will take a complete road safety analysis to uh, uh, in order to uh, qualify for funding there. Uh, under CMAC, there's uh, an emissions calculation requirement for every CMAC project submitted. Uh, the, uh, and uh, we've made that as simple as we can uh, for the non-construction projects. Uh, and those uh, calculation forms are included in the application package. Uh, an important component to remember, and I mentioned this earlier, is a transmittal letter executed by the chief elected official or chief executive officer. How do you submit? By email, using PDFs, uh, mailing your applications in, dropping them off by hand, and yes, we will accept accept handwritten applications. Um, that, to download the forms, uh, go to our website, www.nerpc.org, uh, and follow the instructions. We'll have um, the NOFA published in two locations, uh, one under the events column, and the other one under what's hot. 
So uh, be looking for those this afternoon, if not this afternoon, uh, tomorrow morning probably. Um, you'll need Microsoft Excel uh, for the application forms and the admissions worksheet, Adobe Reader, and Microsoft Word uh, for portions of the uh, HSIP application uh, and the, uh, the actual uh, NOFA document itself. Something uh, worthy of mention has to do with the purchase of uh, CMAC funded alternative fuels. This includes uh, uh, a lot of the gases like LNG, uh, CNG, propane, uh, and as well as uh, uh, the alcohols, the E85s and the like. Uh, Congress has extended the eligibility of these projects through uh, federal fiscal year 2017, that is through September 30th of 2017. So if a community or a client or anyone, a unit of government is interested in applying for uh, alternative fuels uh, to get an 80% subsidy, um, there's a need to get those applications in during this funding cycle because this opportunity uh, will be gone in uh, uh, 2017. Finally, the Federal Highway CMAC guidance is also posted on the website, the same location uh, for anyone interested in the CMAC program to see what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, I'd encourage you to take a look through that thing and uh, give me a call if, if uh, there are questions that you still have. Here are your contact people for the uh, solicitation for HIP. It's Stephen Sisteric. Uh, for Bike and Ped, it's Mitch Barloga. For STP and CMAC, it's myself. For questions regarding emissions calculations, it's Kathy Luther. For public transit, it's Melinda Petrosky. For anything else, uh, it's Amanda Pollard. Our phone number there, 219-763-6060. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you on this, uh, on this solicitation. Um, just uh, as a uh, uh, kind of a FYI type of thing, we will be soliciting again in uh, 2016 for uh, two years worth of uh, funding under each federal aid program. So uh, that's all I have for today. Uh, if you have any comments regarding this presentation or comments on, in general about NERPSI, uh, you can reach us at comments at NERPSI.org uh, or uh, by telephoning us. Uh, anonymously, if you care to, uh, and asking for extension 160. Uh, and you can find us online at these locations. So, Stephanie, I don't have anything further. I'm uh, handing well, it back thanks, to you. Thanks, Gary. And I know everybody's really excited um, about this information. And I did have, um, I just want to let everybody know I will be sending all the links that Gary was mentioning in the webinar, I will be sending that in the follow-up email to everyone, but also it's at nerpsy.org. And I had a question come in, and they said, can CMEC-funded infrastructure projects be fuel-selective, i.e. exclusive certain, um, exclude certain alternative, exclude alternative fuels, certain ones? And include others, presumably? Uh, yes, I'm assuming so. Uh, yeah, uh, we've uh, what we funded in the past have been some electric uh, charging stations. We funded uh, uh, an E85 fuel tank. Uh, actually, done two or three of those things. Um, so yeah, as far as I know, it can be just for a single fuel type. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, I don't know if that answers the question or not. I, th I think it should. And um, is there any specific funding for 
idle reduction at schools or at railroad tracks per se, or would that be under a, a certain umbrella for the funding? That is CMAQ eligible as well. Anything related to idle reduction, uh, and I think we've, uh, uh, I, I know we've looked into that with regard to the locomotives. I'd like to think we could do something, and we have done something with school buses in that regard. Those projects are very beneficial and, and are uh, definitely CMAQ eligible. Great. Does, if anybody has any questions real quick, um, just let me know in the question box. But you also have all of Gary's information and the other folks over at NERPC. And everybody who is on the webinar or uh, was on the webinar should be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow morning um, with the YouTube link to the recorded webinar and the slides and also all of the links that Gary mentioned today. So. Any final thoughts, Gary, or any um, other information you'd like to leave everybody with? I really thank you for your participation here. This is the first time we've reached out in this method to uh, get information out to our stakeholders. Uh, so we'd like some feedback on that as well, to, to know if this is a good thing to keep doing or not. Great. Well, thanks again, Gary. and. I hope everybody has a great day and just look at nerpsy.org or southshorecleancities.org for the webinar information and your email. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Stephanie. Bye. Bye.